Okay, thank you for recording. Um, it's very funny how Zoom's kind of updated now. We keep hearing that that message and that voice. Um, so, good morning, everyone. And today we're going to start talking about what we believe in. And I feel almost as if, you know, the, the way we'll always joke about when you're standing in a supermarket queue in Israel. And by the time you get to the end of the line, the Israeli knows absolutely everything about you, including exactly how much money you do or don't have in your bank account, right? That like, right, we, we all know what I'm talking about, that attitude of it's fine, we share, let's all talk about it. There is a part of me that thinks that talking about what we believe in is a very challenging thing for us to do because actually, it's very, very personal. But the reason I wanted to look at this together, and we're going to look at some sources inside soon, but was because actually, I think that we all just assume that everyone else must know what they believe in and why they believe it, but that I don't necessarily. And I'm including myself. I've been very, very blessed to have an, had an absolutely fantastic Jewish education really second to none. I'm so blessed, whether it was primary school, secondary school, seminary, all the courses I've done since, amazing. How often did we talk about what we do or don't believe in? Interesting, isn't it? So I'm going to start by asking you all to be brave. If you dare, and I know this group well enough now, we've had some very challenging conversations together. But if you dare, would you explain, and we're not going to talk about the whole, the, all the 13 principles of faith, because we will talk about prayer at a future week and whether the Torah is true and whether Moshe is right and whether Moshiach is coming and all, if we believe in those things. For today's class, the way that I would like to challenge you is I'd like to hear from you, what do you believe about God? And I know there's a gentleman in our community that often will say, we never talk about God in our discussions. He always says, Rabbi Sachs spoke about God, but we forget to bring God into the equation. So we talk about relationships between ourselves and other people. We talk about how we relate to our parents, spouses, children, friends, but we forget to talk about the most important relationship, which is between us and God. But before we can even talk about our relationship, can we talk about what we believe about God? It looks like Valerie's going to start by being brave. Well, I'm always brave, but I also have quite strong belief because as I'm hearing you speak, it's not about what's in your head. It's about what's in your heart. And I know my own life, I've had some very, very difficult times and I had very difficult times when I was a little girl because I was always on death's door. And without that belief, I would be hiding under my bed. So um, in a way, I do rely on my relationship with God, um, which probably sounds awful because most of the people I actually know on my daily life think I don't know what I'm talking about. And they just go, hmm, okay if that's what you believe. And then they say, well, I don't believe and yada, yada, yada. But it is very personal. And I think unless you've actually had some near experiences um, and coming back from another sort of weird area of your life, um, you don't actually understand that. And I think if you understand that without having had any experiences, you're so lucky. So thank you, Valerie, for being so honest. Can I, can I ask you something about that? Sure. Do you think that you always had this inner belief and life has just strengthened it? Or do you think that you only gained it through the challenges you went through? Well, I think my life was challenging from about six months of age. Um, and of course the bombs started dropping then and I was really seriously ill. So I always think about my poor mother. Um, and 
I had that um, ruthless survival kit inside. But as I've got older, I think about that survival kit and where that comes from and how do I keep that going. And I think that is with my conversation with the Almighty. And because of the job that I did and the books that I've read, what I've noticed is Rabbi Dr. Twersky and Jung all say the same thing. You have to find your higher self. If that's God, fine. If it's something else, who knows? That's also fine. But without that higher belief, actually, we don't have anything. So I think they're quite good authorities to think about. And, and Valerie, I sorry. That, that in a way, that just verified how I think when I read those books. And I read them very closely together. So it was quite quite interesting thank you valerie and I, I feel like we could say thank you so much everyone for joining us you've you've heard the share you needed to come for just from those words it's it's more powerful than anything i could say valerie so really thank you okay, okay. would would somebody like to to somebody else like to share i'd like to say that i mean i looked to god for guidance uh quite strongly um um, in, a, in, in a lot of things that I do, um, I mean that's that's such a huge subject because um, ultimately guidance is taught through your parents at a very young age, um, and then you leave home and you're away from your parents and you start your own family, um, and then um, for me, I suppose that's when religion really kicked in and the structure of our lives um, and what I'd been taught. Um, and then for personally, for me, for guidance, um, um, I, I also started meditation um, and um, read quite a lot about Buddhism as well and their, their paths. And through that, that brought me back to God again. Um, and mindfulness and... Uh, yes, yes, uh, that's, that's what I've got to say. So would, would you say, um, Jackie, that what Valerie said about um, there being a higher force resonates with you instinctively almost or through studying? Instinctively. It's interesting, isn't it? This is not an intellectual activity, no. is it? Um, no. Just just because you brought it up, Jackie, I'd recommend, I don't know if you've come across, there's a book called Letters to a Buddhist Jew um, by no. Rabbi Tats. Have you heard Rabbi Tats speak before? No. Because he's, he's based in Golders Green, actually. He's a South African rabbi. Um, incredible. Raquel, definitely get him to come and speak to your community. He's just unbelievable. But he has a book. I don't know how, but he came across a Jew practicing Buddhism through the internet. I think I think it was through one of these Ask Your Rabbi or somehow it landed on his doorstep. And he decided to engage in correspondence and he writes, they write letters to each other comparing Judaism and Buddhism. I think you'd wow. find that fascinating. Yeah, letters to yes. a... Buddhist Jew by Buddhist. Akiva Tatz. And I can't remember, his name's David something, but I can't remember. But Thank really, you. really, really cool. Because, you know, uh, I, I think learning from other religions can sometimes really strengthen our own. Exactly. As long exactly. as we and know I, what we stand yeah. for, yeah. I found it fascinating. I mean, those eight paths are all encompassed anyway within Judaism, but um, it just reinforces it in a different way. Is it, so I don't know so much about Buddhism, to be honest, but I do remember when we learnt about um, Islam and you learnt about their five principles, it's like, well, that's Jewish, that's Judaism. You know, we are, we are so similar and we have so much to learn from each other. Exactly. But yet at the same time, um, and yeah. we'll speak about more about this in future, not not for this class, because this class is really about God. But we do have to know that our religion is right, because otherwise we can't just be a, like 
do whatever you want. We have to have this innate sense of pride and connection with what we do. So, you know, I, I think that that might be a really interesting read for you, Jackie. Let me know what you Thank think. You. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else want to share with us? No? Okay. So, <laughs> I'm going to start actually. Um, I can't oh, unmute. Yes. Yes, Denise, please. Yeah. We can hear you now. Right. I just believe in God. I believe there is a God. Um, I think that this pandemic is God's punishment for the way people behave all over the world. And since the world is not going to change, the pandemic is going to continue. Wow, Denise. God, yeah, I think it's God's way of punishing us. And all we can do is do our best. But I wasn't brought up in a Jewish home. I was at a convent for most of my educational life. We had Hebrew lessons and uh, not uh, no Jewish. Uh, they were very good, the nuns. I mean, we had kosher food the whole time, vegetarian. They were very nice. We didn't go to services. We didn't go to prayers. We didn't go to Bible classes. They were extremely careful and caring about what we believed in. Wow. So, uh, you know, I didn't have that, but my Jewish background came from home. But then the war took up so much of the time. Yeah. I have this implicit belief in God. I don't question it. I know that he's there. I say my prayers every night. They're my own personal prayers. They include everybody. And uh, I just pray for the, the good of the world. Uh, uh, mate, Denise, I'm humbled. And again, I will say as I did to Valerie, and I could say to Jackie as well, there's nothing for me to teach here. It's something that you know in the deepest part of your soul. Yeah. I, and I think that that's truly amazing. No, I feel very deeply about this. That Even there and what everything is predestined. Yeah. Amazing, isn't it amazing? And I think I think Denise, you you brought up this this point as well. Is this appreciation that we're not just our body, we are a soul. Our body houses our soul, but right deep inside of us, with the, the part that in, just knows, it just knows without having any rational explanation, without having a discussion, without having a class, there's this deep part inside of us that just knows that we connect to Hashem and that just knows about God and just knows about the way we're protected and looked after and connected to Him. I, I'm not sure about the... Um, the the idea of why we have this pandemic to be honest with you but it could be that you were blessed with the prophecy that i wasn't because i don't god hasn't told me why he does what he does but it could be that you're one of those hidden prophets that does know why no, he's brought the pandemic personal thought yeah nobody's yeah. communicated with me yeah so that i don't know you know that i don't know and you know everyone's entitled to their to their thoughts okay. on that exactly not everybody's thoughts, but <laughs> exactly. Yes, yeah. yes, yeah. exactly. I would like to share with you something a bit different today. Before we go on to the sources, which we will do in a minute, I'd like to share with you a song that has been released recently. It's a song by a Hasidic, very popular singer that you might not have heard of because it might not be popular in every circle. But um, Raquel, I'm curious if you've heard of Benny Friedman. Yeah. So um, I'm assuming nobody else my has. Kids, but... My kids love him. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> he's got some really fun, exciting songs, and I'm assuming nobody else has. Just because I think if it weren't for my kids, it wouldn't have come across my table either. Um, you know, he's got a song where he sings about the importance of smiling, the importance of saying thank you, and he has recently come out with a song called "A Yid." Now we know the word "yid." can sometimes be used as a derogatory term. But actually, I heard someone say this recently, if someone calls you Yid, you should say, why, thank you. 
because they're calling you a Jew and we should be proud. Anti-Semitism is going to be another discussion. We're not talking about that today. But this song is talking about the idea of what a Yid is. Now, before I play it, I would like to just um, comment on the fact that it is it does show quite a lot of imaging. It's written after this year that we've gone through. So there's a lot of imaging about COVID and masks and other things. I haven't watched the whole thing through, to be honest, and I don't think I'm going to play the whole thing. But just to warn you that if it, that does feel triggering for you, then just don't, don't watch the... You can listen to the words without watching the film. Um, but I wanted to share this, this um, clip with you it's a lovely song and it's been shared quite a lot recently to talk about the importance of having faith. But at the end of it, um, I'd like you to see if you could think of what question my one of my children asked me on this song. Um, you'll see what I mean in a second. OK, so I'm going to play a short clip and then at the end of it, based on the chorus, I'd like you to tell me if you think you have a question on on what what um, Benny Friedman's singing. Now, I know that a song is not Torah philosophy, right? And, you know, anyone can say anything that they want, but I thought it brought out an interesting discussion. Let's see if I can get this to work now. Um, a yid. Here we go. My friend in times like these it's hard to see past the insanity in a reality so uncertain and unknown life as we knew it forever changed and there's no peace of mind to be found who can even make sense of tomorrow when our dreams keep crashing to the ground And yet, as we rise to greet another day And the sun is still bright in the sky Always a reason to hope for better times Though it seems like the answer's worlds away We've got enough, just enough to keep us going Holding on to unbroken simple faith Cause the heat never breaks and the heat never bends And the heat never gives up in the night The heat perseveres through the deepest despairs His Okay, I could share the whole song, it is beautiful, but I wanted to focus on that chorus. So the word emuna, which they use, um, means faith, right? Well, that's how we translate it, we translate it as faith. And tata we know is father, right? Daddy is tata. So we've got those words of a yid never breaks, and a yid never bends, and a yid never gives up in the night. A yid perseveres through the deepest despairs, his faith, his emuna strengthens him for the fight. And a yid understands that Hashem has a plan. And then I forgot how the rest goes. Okay, but you, you, got, you got the idea. What do you think my children, or, or maybe you even, actually, when I first was listening to this, I had this question. Any questions on this kind of statement? Well, it's, it, it, it's, the, the, the world is a very uncertain place. Um, and he's trying to strengthen um, your mind to feel that you're part of a, a plan. But really and truly, none of us know what's going to happen. And, and then that, that leaves you with a lot of uncertainty. 
yeah. I don't know if that's what you're yeah. looking at. So, Jackie, I think I think you're spot on. You know, my, my, one of my kids said to me, and this is what I, I, I was sitting very uncomfortably with this because it was being passed around and it is very inspiring, the message. I'm not taking away from that. But I, I was sitting around saying, really, we never bend and we never break and we never give up? How can that be? How can we say that? Because to me, that's almost as if I'm saying, well, it's not okay to sometimes waver in your faith. But isn't that, isn't that how, what, what Israel's built on, that kind of arrogancy? Go on, elaborate. Well, no, I mean, the strength of the people of the Jews living in Israel is built on that mindset, totally. Totally. Maybe it's only the diaspora Jews that think out of that bubble, but 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 they're totally in that mindset. Is what they're taught in the army. It's um, it's how uh, the Israeli Jewish nation has to think because they're in a totally different situation to us in the diaspora. I would even add to that, Jackie, and I think actually I'd add to that, that maybe all of us have to feel that because we've survived million, like thousands of years of persecution. And actually, maybe if we would have bent and break, we know that then maybe we wouldn't be here. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's not just yes, now at the moment, Israel really does have to stand, you know, almost, I think maybe arrogance is the right word or with determination in the face of, of their enemies. But maybe... All of us, you know, I, I've, I'm sure I've shared this with this group and I say this often, maybe the only reason we're here is because our bubbers were crying when they lit their Shabbos candles. And the only reason, please God, we'll have Jewish great-great-grandchildren is because we're crying when we, we light our Shabbat candles. You know, that, that, that determination, maybe arrogance, maybe that strong sense of we always believe, but I think what my question is, um, Jackie, and I, I'm curious if this resonates with anyone else. Being completely honest with you, there have been times where my belief has been shaken. There have been times where I have, I have questioned and challenged and cried and not really felt strong and never bends and never breaks and never questions and my faith is so strong during the night sometimes it feels like well actually I give up or I want to give up and my challenge with this song and I said it's only a song it's not terror source but it's based on our our mentality maybe is if I say that it's not okay to ever waver am I then saying to some people actually the way you feeling with the way you're feeling is not valid that's not a jewish way to feel and god forbid it because i think benny friedman himself would say god forbid it so how can we make it something we're comfortable with and this is i was discussing with with elchanan with my husband because it really sat wrong with me and he's a um he's a psychotherapist and a rabbi so he's quite he's got quite a good to, like you said, Rabbi Dr. Twersky, one day maybe he'll be like him, Valerie. But um, he, he comes with it from two very, very good angles, I think. And he said, maybe what we're talking about is our soul. The part of us that is a soul, that is a part of God, that never changes. That is always spiritual, shining bright, focused, understands, never bends, connected completely with God. But God didn't make us just souls. God put us in bodies. God gave us heart, emotions, feelings. And sometimes we don't feel those things and that's okay as well. So I think that the message, when he's saying a yid, we're talking about the pintala yid. Have you come across that expression? Pintala means little, right? The little Jew. And we say inside each and every single one of us is a pintala Jew. I can't remember if I shared this story with you. I, w I, I feel like I did, but you'll forgive it. You'll forgive it for me because it's it's a great one. I went. Um, I wanted to buy some specialist shoes in Watford. There's a great running shop, running shoe shop. I don't run, right? I'm not athletic at all. But my my feet were hurting me, and I was recommended to get these specific types of trainers. So I went to Watford and the guy helped me that, you know, it's a really clever shop. It, they, I don't know if you've been anywhere like this, they put you on the treadmill and they 
analyze the way you step and they find exactly what that like really really cool if i was a runner it makes a lot of sense you know if i walk around the corner i've done well for the day so it, it made me laugh but anyway they, they fitted me with the great shoes and then at the end we were coming to to pay for it i think it must have been december time something like that and as i came to pay so i gave him my debit card and my maiden name's rosenberg it's still on my oh i really anything official that's the name i still use so i'm coming to pay and he goes oh rosenberg he's so he said something to me like happy hanukkah or something like that now we've all had that situation yeah we call it bageling when you're all, or bageling when you need to make it clear to somebody that you're also jewish right we had it we were sitting on the train we were coming back from town in the days when we could go to see things in town right and we were sitting on the train and it was a jam-packed carriage and you know Elchanan has his kippah on, I'm dressed very modestly. So it's pretty obvious that we're a Jewish um, couple. He's got a beard. Um, and two boys, two young 20 year olds sitting opposite us started singing benching. Like it was so funny. Like you don't just sit on a random train on the way to Stanmore and feel that you need to sing benching. But clearly they wanted us to know we have a pintaliyid. We have a little soul inside of us that can never, ever, ever be distinguished extinguished sorry it doesn't matter how much we're persecuted it doesn't matter how much we're assimilated that pintaliyid is always inside of us and it's just been amazing you know we can be in the randomest places it always every single time it happens we always say oh that's such a great sermon and i know that's going to be al khanan's yom kippur sermon because it literally every situation every holiday you know we were in spain one time on the jet skis uh, on the speedboat and the guy's telling us he couldn't speak english but he was telling us oh yeah i'm also jewish and he shows us his megan david we all have that soul inside of us and that soul never bends and never breaks and will always stay connected to those principles what's incredible to hear in this group is how some of you have gone through some real challenges in life and i think actually probably everyone has gone through some real challenges in life and yet you hold on to those principles of it maybe in spite of or maybe because of we hold on to those principles of faith so thank you for sharing those really I intimate parts of, of your life with me. But at the same time, realize, if, first of all, if anyone's listening who's not sure if they do believe, or if any of us who even have commented sometimes feel stronger in our belief and sometimes say, how could this possibly be happening? Those are also okay. Because we have that pintalayid that is always connected. And then we're human beings that surround it. And that's okay. It's okay to be angry. It's okay to be sad. It's okay to question. Those are all things that are okay. And in case you think it's just me, Jacqueline Feldman, sitting here in sunny bushy telling you that I think it's okay, I want you to know that Moshe asked Hashem. Moshe asked Hashem the biggest question, which is, you know, why do bad things happen to good people? And Hashem said to him, it's not for you to know. So I always say this, if it was good enough for Moshe, it's good enough for you and me. We are allowed to ask questions. What I think is beautiful about that question or about the question, the statement when someone says, I hate God or I'm angry at God, which I felt in my life. Yeah, I'm not going to pretend I haven't. It's okay. I'm not saying that I don't believe in God. You can't be angry at something that you don't think is there. And I think, again, that's part of, not that I'm saying if someone does question if there is God or not, that's fine as well. And that's an interesting conversation to have. And it's interesting if it comes from an intellectual place. Very often when people challenge those sort of things, when you speak to them for more than two minutes, it's actually because how could he have done this to my family member? How could he have done this to my friend? How could he have done this to me, right? Very often it always comes back to emotions. I can't say for sure always, but it's just very interesting that we each have this very, very strong sense inside of ourselves that sometimes we're more in touch with than other times. So I'm gonna share with you now my screen. Um, let's see if this works. I'll see you guys now. Video panel, okay. And um, any questions on, oh, on anything that I've said so far or we, are we feeling okay or in agreement? Does it resonate with you? Jacqueline, can I just um, say that 
our relationship, we know we all have an individual relationship with Hashem. And I suppose it's like any other relationship that it ebbs and flows on our journeys. And um, that it that's okay. Exactly. Exactly. And I, 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 I'm always, I'm, uh, I notice, or I have noticed now that I'm old enough to notice that people, you know, at the end of their lives, even if they haven't lived a life that's been, um, you know, strictly observant, they always turn, seem to turn their attention to Hashem. Um, and uh, I think there's a reason for that. Yeah. I don't quite know what it is, but I, I feel it, it's okay for our relationship with Hashem to ebb and flow on our, on our journeys. I think it's meant to be that way. Yeah, definitely. Thank you, Rose. I, I, I really like that. I think you're right. I think it's a relationship. A relationship is only as good as what you put in it. Right. So it depends how much we invest in the relationship. God's always putting in a hundred and a million percent. Right. That you don't need to worry about. That never changes. Right. God is always giving us way more than we deserve. God is always giving us everything. But it's our relationship with him. Do we ever talk to him? Do we ever think about him? Do we ever try to connect with him? And we know how to connect because he's given us a Torah and mitzvah. And we'll talk about that another time. But first, before we can do that, when we're in a relationship, the first thing we need to actually do is who is this person? You know, I, I, I met my husband through a shidduch, right? So yes, we asked lots of questions beforehand, but when we first met, we had to get a sense of this is a stranger. Do I want to spend the rest of my life with him? And the weirdest thing was I came home after the first date, told my parents I'm marrying this guy. You know, how did I know that after one one time? I don't know. Can we now talk about everything to do with God and therefore we'll know him intimately? I'm not sure. It's a lifelong discovery. God is a lot more complex, but in a way a lot more simple, right? Because he's not changing. We're the ones that change and our life situation changes and what's going on around us. But 100%, Rose, I think you're right. It's a relationship. And I think it was Denise that you said about our parents. One of the interesting thing is... Um, if we think, you know, and, and the homes we're raised in, part of the reason that we're able to believe in this divine being of God, and we'll talk about how to describe what God is, is actually if we were blessed enough to have had a relationship with our parents, that's a model of what it means to have a relationship with something that's bigger than us. And actually that connects to what we were talking about right at the beginning, when we've got this really weird dynamic at the moment where children are telling their parents what they can and can't do. That's not really a Torah principle. I know they're doing it actually for all the right reasons and it's to keep everyone safe. But what we do have in the Torah is this idea of respecting our parents. And the reason that we do that, and when we have a positive relationship with our parents, that enables us to have a positive relationship with Hashem. Valerie, you'll be more qualified than me to talk about this, but I do wonder when people have come across abuse or when people have come across very challenging um, treatment by their parents, does that affect their ability to connect and relate to God and to faith? And I believe it does. I think in that situation, you're so taken up with your hurt and your pain. Um, I don't think you can see past that. I think that's extremely difficult. Having dealt with a lot of very um, orthodox people who have had that situation, um, I think they find it very difficult. I don't think any of them ever stopped being religious as such. And they never spoke to me about what was in their heart. But what a lot of them did was just moved away from their family. And one particular family, which I always think about. Um, and always in these families, it's always another family member, which is always horrible. And... Um, this particular girl decided in the end she wanted to tell her father. And 
she decided she was going to phone her father in my presence. And he wanted to speak to me. And he said to me, his first thing that he said to me was, do you believe her? And I said, it's taken us a very long time to come to this. And yes, I do believe her because I've had many situations when you know they've made it up and you haven't believed them. And he then went into, as it was a brother-in-law, what was he going to do with the other daughter? And the one that I was seeing wanted the father to take action. And the father didn't want to take action because he didn't want to upset the marriage of the other daughter. Now, what I was thinking had to be completely irrelevant because I didn't necessarily agree with his attitude, but I could see his reasoning. Um, it was very difficult, but what she did, she, uh, she did finally, I mean, she was um, over 23 by the time she got married, which in her circle was quite late. And she finally married somebody who was a long, long way away from her family. So she didn't have to mix with them. Um, it was very difficult, but in my heart of hearts, and it still bugs me now, this was a long time ago, is what was that father doing? You had little girls as children and probably had other children. What was going to happen when those little girls had friends to come and stay? That has always worried me. And I've always thought about where was the father of that daughter, what was he thinking about? And it worries me. Now, it's none of my business in some ways, but it can't, you can't help worrying about some of these things. Um, yes, they were all very God-fearing. Um, so uh, Valerie, I'm gonna actually come in here and challenge you. I oh. wonder, I think there's a very big difference between being very religious and what you believe in. And I wonder if somebody like this young lady, and I'm not picking on her, I don't even know her, but I, I would understand if somebody like this young lady actually has a very hard time believing in God. They might keep everything or relating to God or having that relationship because the one person in her life who's meant to protect her didn't. And I think that's where I was coming from, this idea of it's very challenging to believe in God when the people that are meant to represent authority don't do the right thing. Because what she expected when she confronted her father was that her father was going to be all encompassing to her. Yeah. And of course that invariably doesn't happen. And it's that dichotomy that happens. And I think that happens with our faith and with our relationship with God or with our father, because in many ways, it's so similar. Yeah, it's exactly. So I think it is, it's a, it's a, like an amplified relationship. And actually, you know, the, the person who would really be able to give a lot of insight on this is your wonderful Roberts and Naomi, because obviously this is exactly what she works with. Yes. Um, you know, it really, really interesting. Thank you, Valerie. Okay, so just to make sure that we actually do see the actual principles inside because otherwise I think Raquel might give me the sack. <laughs> so we're going to be talking about the 13 principles of faith. Now we come across these in different ways. They're based on the principles of the Rambam, Maimonides, and we'll look at him in a second. And the ones that I'm going to share with you now are called the Animamins. So we, we may be familiar with a song that we'll often sing and it was sung as the Jews were brought to the gas chambers, this song, song of Animamin, I believe with perfect faith that Moshiach will come. There's actually 13 Animamins, we're gonna look at those. And we're going to see how this is also brought in different places. I'm not bringing you all 13 because each week we're going to deal with different ones. This week we're going to be looking at the first four. One second. Right. Okay, thank you. Um, let's move this out of the way. I don't know how to do it where I can do both. Okay, so I believe this the 13 principles of faith. So the first four that I would like to share with you, and these are found at the end of Shacharit on us in, in our Siddur. 
So we have Ani Ma'amin Ve'emunah Shalema, which here is translated, and we always say translation is is second best to the Hebrew. It's not exact, but I believe with complete faith that the Creator, blessed is His name, is the Creator and Guide of all created things, and He alone has made, does make, and will make all things. So our first principle of faith, and the word principle even is clunky English. We talk about these being the ikrim, ikar. Ikar is the root. These are the roots of what we believe in, right? Everything is branches off from here, these 13 principles of faith. So the first one is this idea that God makes, made everything and continues to make everything and, and will do so in the future as well. Very much saying that we don't believe in the clockmaker theory, that Hashem made a clock, winds it up and leaves it to run. Hashem is actually, we say that he recreates the world every single day, every single minute, every single second. He's very much involved in every part of our lives. So for example, when Denise, you spoke about why COVID happened, why we had this pandemic, like I said, I don't know. But the one thing I do know is it's come through God. You know, God is very much part of everything that happens. Now, that can raise very hard questions, like how can God bring about the Holocaust, right? That's a that's a big one. We're not going to address that today. Um, but the, the idea of we're not going to disconnect anything from God, that's what this one is saying, that everything, he makes everything, it all comes from him. That's one aspect of God that we're describing. The next aspect, right? We know the word echad, that he is one. So I believe with complete faith that the creator blessed is his name is unique and there is no uniqueness like his in any manner. And the, that he alone is our God who was, is, and will ever be, right? That's a really important principle that we believe in, that God is forever and ever and ever and ever, right? It never ending. The next one, I believe with complete faith that the creator blessed is his name is not corporeal and that he is beyond all corporeal concepts and there is nothing at all comparable to him. So the, the English is clunky again. Let's go to the Hebrew. I, I believe in the, the creator of all, blessed is his name. He doesn't have a, a, a form. He doesn't have a body right? There's nothing about him that's physical. So that's another aspect to understanding Hashem. And finally, I believe with complete faith that the creator, blessed is his name, is first and last, right? Who Rishon, he's the first and he's the last. God is everything. So these four, these four principles, they're the first four of the 13, give us um, quite a good description actually about Hashem. And I'd like to ask you just for a minute to look at these and just to let me know if there's anything that actually maybe you want to question or think about or challenge that you, you're not sure how well that sits with you. The people we've heard speak so far, it sounds very much like this is something that, yeah, of course I believe these things. But I'm just asking you to step back for a second and just think, is there anything on here that actually, do I really believe that? Someone want to comment? Well, we're all happy with these principles. Yes. Okay. So, Jackie, are you going to say something? I can't. Were you on mute? Did you want to say anything, Jackie? You... <laughs> no, no, no. I, I'm reading it again, and I, uh, yeah, I mean, it's what I've been taught. It's how I feel. That's yeah. how we feel. Yeah, amazing, yeah. isn't it? Now, yeah. what's interesting, and we'll hopefully. Um, actually, I'll bring it in there because I don't know if I'll have a chance at the end. I think what we need to do to challenge ourselves, though, is if this is the way that we feel and we believe, do we really live based on these? I'll give you an example. So I'm waiting for the bus because I'm late for an appointment. If I truly believe that God is the creator of all things, that God is before and after, that God's involved in every single aspect of my life, there's absolutely no reason in the world that I should feel nervous, that I should feel worried that I'm going to miss the bus or that I'm running late or that someone's going to be upset or that I'm going to miss the opportunity or et cetera, et cetera. And think about, that's more challenging now, isn't it? So yes, I think it's amazing. And 
like I said, if we don't believe in every single one of those, there's no guilt. That's fine. It's something to talk through and explore and decide and discuss. I do believe probably each of our souls connects to it, but it depends where we are in ourselves, how, how, how much we can just connect to it or how much we need to challenge. The, the, the question is, can we live with this faith? Can it actually affect our anxiety levels? And I'm not talking about clinical anxiety, right? I'm talking about just when we get worried about things or when we're not sure how things are going to turn out. We're all human beings, right? And God knows that and God's okay with that. But how amazing would it be if rather than just knowing that this is something that I intrinsically believe and I can pull on when I'm in a really difficult situation, how amazing would it be that if on the day-to-day minute by minute interactions that I have with the world around me, I can carry this consciousness at the forefront of my mind, not at the back of my mind, to actually make me feel more comfortable within my own skin, within my own situation, within what's going on. So that's just an interesting thing for us to think about rather than just learning emunah or believing in emunah, believing in faith. Can we live with these principles? Can we live with emunah? And we'll look at that a bit more um, in, at future time. So what's interesting about these 13 principles, they come from the Rambam, Maimonides, and you can see his name was Moshe ben Maiman. He lived between 1834 and 1204. What was interesting um, about these is actually they don't really appear in any other place. So the Maimonides has kind of come up with these himself almost, so to speak which is a strange thing to do because Maimonides himself also says that every single part of the Torah is important. How can we say that one's more important than the other? Therefore, how does the Maimonides suddenly come up with saying these are the most important principles of faith? That's a bit of a challenge, but he does and he and we very much connect to them and I'll show you in a minute how we, we all know these principles of faith. You just don't realize that that's what you're singing when you sing it, but that it, they're something that, that is very connected to us. What's interesting about Maimonides is the place where he brings down these principles of faith, and they're not written exactly as they were on, on this slide with the Animamin, but they are the same principles. The place where he brings it down is actually where he talks about who does not deserve a place in the world to come. We have a principle that every Jewish person deserves a well, a place in Olam Haba in the world to come. And then the Rambam comes up with a list of except. Except somebody who does not believe in these are the first four of 13 things. If you don't believe in one of these things, then according to the Rambam, you do not have a place in the world to come. If you don't believe that God was always here, will always be here, and is here and will always be here, if you don't believe that he made, makes, and will continue to make, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, that is a way that you can forfeit your portion in the world to come. That's, that's where he learns these principles. Again, Maimonides in a different place brings down this source. The foundation of foundations and the pillar of wisdom is to know that there is a first being and that he causes all other beings to be and that all things existing from heaven to earth and whatever is between them exist only through the rarity of his existence. Now remember that throughout our sages, they lived at times where lots of these principles were being challenged and in a way no more so than right now, right? There is a lot of challenge to, are the Torah principles valid? Do we believe? Is there really an ultimate being who gets to decide how we de how we should behave? Or can everyone just do what feels right, what society decides right, etc.? And it comes out in so many different ways. But we all know to the intrinsic part of our very being, to our soul, the foundation of foundations, the pillar of wisdom is that there is a first being and that he causes other beings to be, right? Um, Rabbi Sachs in Covenant and Conversation talks about the difference between the God of Arist Aristotle and the God of Abraham. Aristotle thought that God knew only universe, not par particulars. That is the God of science, of the enlightenment of Spinoza. The God of, God of Abraham is the God who relates to us in our singularity, in what makes us different from others, as well as what makes us the same. This ultimately is the difference between the two great principles of Judaic ethics, justice and love. Justice is universal. It treats all people alike, rich and poor, powerless, powerful and powerless, making no distinction on the basis of color or class. But love is particular. A parent loves his or her children for what makes them each unique. The moral life is a combination of both. 
That is why it cannot be reduced solely to universal laws. That is what the Torah means when it speaks of the right and the good, over and above the commandments, statutes, and testimonies. We can't just sit together in a room and decide this is what we as human beings feel is ethically, morally, spiritually, physically, etc., equal, right, and just in the world. Right? It's not just about that. It's also about love. It's about getting that balance right. But it's about the idea that Hashem is actually involved in every single aspect of our lives. It's not just that he made us, dropped us in the world and said, get on with it. That's not what we believe. In some ways, it would be a lot easier to, to believe that. You can answer the Holocaust question very easily if you just say, well, God just let us get on with this. That's why the Holocaust happened, because people did bad things. That goes against what we believe in, because we don't believe that Hashem just let us get on with it. We believe that God is involved in every single aspect of our lives. Um, these are just some of the principles. I'm conscious of the time, and I'm actually going to skip forward. So that was some of the principles from the Rambam. But I said to you that there is a place that we know about this from. And the place we know about this from is a song that we sing at the end of Friday nights or other times possibly in Shul as well, the song of Yigdal. Right? I hope that's a song that many of us are familiar with. This hymn written by Daniel Ben Yehuda, who was a Dian in Ro Rome about 1300, is based on Maimonides' 13 principles of Judaism. According to Maimonides, failure to believe in a single one of these principles places one outside the pale of Judaism. The first principle is the existence of God. So we say, Yigdal Elohim Chai, Yishtabach, Nimtsavi Ein Et El Metziotah. Exalted is the living God and praised he exists and his existence transcends time. So that's the first principle. Next we talk about Achdut Hashem, God is one. So we talk about Echad v'yen yachid ki yichuda, ne'lam v'gam e'en sof li'achduto. He is one and there is no unity like his. He is invisible. His unity is infinite. God is uncorporeal. E'en lo d'mut ha'guf ve'en no guf. Lo narach elav kadushato. He is unlike the corporeal or even the non-corporeal. God can not, also not be compared to the angels. His holiness is beyond comparison. And finally, the fourth principle, which is Kadmat Hashem, the God is eternal. Kadmon l'chol davar Hashem nivra, rishon re'en reshit l'reshito. He precedes every being that was created. He was first and there was no genesis to his beginning. And it continues, but those were the first four principles that we, that we shared together. I'm not going to sing you Yigdal. I hope you're singing it in your own head. But I also hope that whenever you next sing it, or when you next hear it, um, actually, it's not just a lovely little song that we chant together. We are talking about what we believe, and we should be proud and hold our heads up high that we have this belief. Our Pintala Yid, our Neshama, uh, the part inside of us is completely connected to these beliefs. Sometimes we may waver, right? And you remember I shared the song with you this time as well about what a Yid is, what is a Jew. And actually the soul of us never, never is weak, never questions, always is connected. Sometimes there's just so much junk in the way that we can't feel that. And that's really what our job is sometimes, to deal with all the other complex feelings and emotions and Maybe it's even practical things that are getting in the way of us relating to Hashem and having that incredible relationship, Roz, that you spoke about, Denise, you spoke about, Jackie and Valerie, you all spoke about this incredible gift that we have, that we can just feel it. I don't need to teach you what it is. You know what it is. You feel it inside of you. Please, God, we should all be able to constantly feel the love and protection of Hashem in our lives, that he's looking after us that he cares about us, that he's involved in every single aspect of our lives, whether good or whether bad. We should always feel his hug. We should feel him carrying us, even though we said he doesn't have a form, but we should feel carried by Hashem um, in our lives and connect to this incredible gift that we have, which is our soul and the faith that we have in Hashem. We should be able to live with our emunah, with our faith. It's wonderful to see all of you today. And please, God, I'm going to be seeing Naomi's going to continue next time talking about how our beliefs connect with prayer, praying to Hashem. And please, God, we're going to continue looking through the 13 principles together um, in a couple of weeks' time. I will see you all again. Thank you so much. It's been wonderful. Thank you. I've really thank enjoyed you. my thank hour. Thank you, Jacqueline. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Definitely. Thank you, Jacqueline. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Lovely to see you all. And lovely to see you, always. <laughs> see you soon, everyone. Take care. Bye.
Bye.